Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us today. Hopefully you can see my screen here. I'm just going to give a few brief introductory remarks before we get underway with our sessions for the day. I wanna welcome you all. My name is Heather Benway. I'm a senior research specialist at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and the executive officer of the Ocean Carbon and Biogeochemistry or OCB project office. I am an oceanographer by training with interests in carbon and climate science and marine biogeochemistry, as long as we're, we'll hopefully all be sharing with each other and meeting new people and learning what people do and what their interests are. I wanna start with a thank you because it's really important to say thank you. Uh, we have an incredible team. Um, I want to, um, hopefully you can all see this okay. Um, I want to first of all thank our sponsors for the OCB Project Office, NSF, and NASA. Um, I want to thank the physical host of our project office, which is Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And they put up with our usually in-person summer workshops every year where we take over the entire campus. Um, unfortunately, we can only have about 200 people for a physical meeting at, at Woods Hole. So this opportunity is wonderful because now we have nearly 800 people signed up for this workshop so far, and that keeps growing every day. So. Tell your friends if they wanna join, we can certainly accommodate that. Um, but it's been great to have much more international engagement in this meeting as well. I wanna thank our event hosts from ePoster Boards. A big shout out to, to Mike Elliott, especially, who is leading a fabulous team of people who have put together a really, really nice meeting space for us. I wanna thank the OCB Scientific Steering Committee and the session chairs who've put this year's sessions together. And I wanna thank our speakers who have, have put together amazing talks and you can watch actually the majority of them now online. People have been really great about recording. We've tried to include closed captioning when possible. Sometimes it was technologically not possible, but um, if you want to view things and you want help, I will personally transcribe captions for you. So please reach out. Um, we wanna make sure these talks are accessible to everyone. I want to thank the amazing team that I work with here in the OCB project office, uh, Maid Mahegan and Mary Zawoski. And I want to thank you for being here. Um, it's when the people come, the meeting happens. So thank you so much for being here. Just give me one second. Little glitch. This workshop was planned while working on the ancestral lands of the Wampanoag Nation made up of Mashpee, Aquina, and Herring Pawden tribes. We honor and respect the many diverse indigenous peoples still connected to this land and the lands of our participants. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and the substantial traditional and local knowledge that indigenous people hold and sustain. This is only from the Woods Hole perspective, and I know that you are all sitting on the indigenous lands of, of other groups, so we want to acknowledge that as well. Just briefly, the OCB Code of Conduct. It's written here. I don't need to go through it with you. Um, you can go through it on your own. This orange button, which you will find on the side panes of, of pretty much every meeting space that we have here, will take you to our code of conduct page and an incident reporting form. If you experience any disturbing behaviors whatsoever, don't hesitate to report that or contact one of us in the project office. You can use this email address here written in orange to reach any of us at any time. Just briefly going over our virtual meeting space, which you're going to have a lot of fun with. I know it's overwhelming at first, but it's actually pretty simple to navigate around. The first thing I wanna point you to is this, you'll see this video in the upper left corner. You will see that pretty much in every one of the meeting spaces. It is the welcome video for the OCB 2021 workshop. You can learn all about how to use the platform, how to navigate to our different meeting spaces, how to use the whiteboards, how to set up your profile, all the stuff that you really need to know. So take five minutes, invest that time to make sure that you have a better meeting. Um, we really tried to focus this meeting on more interaction and discussion. That's why the talks have been pre-recorded for you to watch on your own time. Um, there are help desks everywhere. Please be patient. Please be kind. Technical, technical problems happen. 
often you can just refresh your browser and problems fixed. Um, there's, a, like I said, there's an ePoster Boards help desk pretty much in every meeting space, and there's an OCB help desk in the breakout and lobby spaces as well. And we also have an OCB table in the networking space on floor six, so you can always come find one of us. Let's see, what else do I have to tell you about? So we have elevators. Please note that you might be sitting on the first floor now, but there's a replicate of this space um, times eight floors. So you can go up in the elevator and explore some of the other floors. Um, we would ask when you're when you're doing your um, breakout sessions or your, your space to fill up the first floor space first and then make your way up. Um, the navigation buttons, you'll see green ones. These denote the meeting spaces. We are today, we are in the breakout room. Um, the blue is informational materials and resources. Like you can get a pop up of today's agenda. You can go to our workshop website. You can visit the virtual poster gallery. Um, you can view the poster directory um, to tell you who's presenting where, what day, when. And you can also, there's a networking directory that tells you about the networking spaces and who's at what table on what floor. Um, I can tell you that in a lot of these spaces, there's content on most, on most of the floors. So please do explore. I wanna also say that the poster gallery is gonna be up through August. So if you don't have a ton of time right now, take some time later this summer and, and invest your time in the virtual in person or the in, in person interactions that we'll have during the actual live poster sessions. So today, just a quick rundown. We've got the plenary session from 1215 to 215 today. Opportunities and challenges, challenges and ecological forecasting happening right here in the breakout room. You're gonna be starting on floors one through four. Note that there are two sets of breakout sessions for this. Um, so you wanna start on floors one through four, finding a physical settings topic table that interests you. All the tables are labeled and we'll be using the whiteboards to take notes of our discussions. Instead of making you do homework for today, you'll be getting to watch a live in-person talk um, so we'll be we'll also be posting that on the website and YouTube channel later on, but you can enjoy a live in person talk today for this session. That will be what kicks off the session. Our session chairs are going to explain in a lot more detail how the session will work. Um, but these are your your instructions for right now. Once as soon as the stage mode is off, you can go find a table at a physical settings topic that you care about that interests you. After the plenary session today, we're going to have a short bio break and time for informal chatting. Those usually happen in the lobby, so you can connect with people in the lobby. You can go get another coffee. You can go grab lunch, whatever it is you need to do. And then we'll proceed to the poster hall for our very first poster session. Remember, use the directory, the poster directory, to find out who is presenting today and where you can find them, which, which station they're presenting at. At 3.15, we're going to return to this breakout room where we are right now, where SSC members and I will give a brief introduction to kick off an important discussion about justice, equity, diversion, and diversity and inclusion in OCB and the ocean sciences, and what actions we can take as networks, organizations, institutions, and individuals. After our introduction, we'll go into breakout discussions with a report out at the end. By 4.15 today, you will have all earned a happy hour, which will take place in the lobby. Um, there are tables and groups of all sizes. Um, remember, there are eight floors to this space. So if things are pretty full on the first floor, head up to the second or third floors. These are really meant to be informal opportunities to socialize about science or non-science topics, whatever you choose. Bring your pets, bring your families, go out on the deck, have a drink, um, depending on what hour it is, wherever you are, um, uh, whatever it is that you need to do. Just a couple of reminders. If you have poster sessions coming up, please be sure to sign up for and complete an ePoster Boards test session before your live poster presentation. Um, you can find the ePoster Boards presenter community site. It's accessible from the poster page of the workshop website and also from the poster hall on the side navigation bar. It'll be one of those blue buttons. Similarly, if you're a speaker, and that includes anybody going up on stage at any time, whether you're chairing a session, moderating a panel, Q&A and discussion, giving a presentation, 
please sign up for and complete an ePoster Boards test session before your presentation. Speaker community site is accessible from both the breakout room and lecture halls um, as one of those side blue buttons and also from our workshop website. This training will take only a few minutes of your time and will get you a lot more comfortable navigating a new platform. So it is well worth your time to avoid anxiety and ensure that we have a smooth session. And if you are working on a whiteboard during a breakout session, such as today's JEDI session, and there's going to be report outs at the end, you can take a snapshot of your notes or ideas or drawings, doodles, whatever you have. If you wanna share that with other participants during the report out, when you're up on stage talking, you can just drop a picture of it in the chat, just drop a snapshot, and I can actually screen share it for you and make it big on the screen. If you have any questions about how to do this, come see me or see an e-poster boards person. With that, I wanna hand it off to Mike Elliott for some quick notes about the e-poster boards platform. All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome. Um, we're super excited to be your host in this virtual conference software. Uh, there's a little bit of a learning curve with this software compared to your typical Zoom or Teams meeting, uh, as Heather mentioned. So we want you to know how you can find us uh, for tech help. And we like to ask for patience and grace as everyone learns how to navigate the software, uh, since many of you are first time guests and presenters. So um, sorry to those of you who are hearing some of this content again from attending a prior session, but some of it is going to be new today. Uh, right now, we're in what we call stage presentation mode, and we're in the breakout room event space. Uh, the stage presentation takes over everyone's screen at once, so we're all seeing what's on stage regardless of what table we're at in the room. If you're not a speaker, you can interact via the chat or the Q&A panel at the right side of your screen. You can enter things in the Q&A anonymously, and you can click items in the Q&A to upvote questions or comments that you'd like to see featured or addressed by the speakers. Uh, today, as Heather mentioned, the program split between the breakout room, which is where we are now, and later today we'll funnel you toward the poster hall as well, uh, again, concluding the day in the lobby for that happy hour. Each event space has its own function, and keep your eyes peeled for announcements that are going to direct you uh, to the event spaces where activities are taking place. Uh, for the upcoming session, we're going to stay here in stage mode and bring a group of panelists on stage. Uh, they're going to go through a presentation and then issue a charge to breakout sessions. And at that point, we're gonna return you to map mode. Uh, when we do return you to map mode, you'll find yourself at a table with others and you'll see icons filling seats on the map. Each icon represents a person and each table is intentionally limited to the number of visible seats. Uh, you can move to a new table by double clicking any table with an open seat. You can find additional tables as Heather mentioned on other floors by using the control panel at the left side of your screen when you're in map mode. Uh, please note for today, the first breakout activity takes place, as Heather said, on floors one through four. Each table has a specific label that's going to be indicating the theme or topic for that table's discussion. So please take a second to look at the map and determine where you'd like to go. Again, you'll be able to see that as soon as we shut down the stage mode and return you to the map. Um, if a theme that you'd like to discuss has a full table, again, as Heather mentioned, consider looking to floors two, three, or four for another table uh, with the same theme. And then after the first breakout activity, everyone's going to move up from floors one through four to floors five through eight. Uh, and we'll make announcements to that effect. We'll help uh, move you to the right place. But again, we'll be moving up to floors five through eight for the second breakout activity. And you'll see differently labeled uh, tables with uh, some different discussion questions in the whiteboards. So during sessions today, except for when we're on stage as we are now, uh, we want to remind you that you can control your own camera and microphone. There's a control panel at the bottom of your screen when you're in map mode. Um, we certainly encourage everyone to be an active participant and have cameras and microphones on. Consider muting your microphone temporarily if you hear any audio feedback when others are speaking. Headphones are definitely your friend when it comes to preventing audio feedback. Um, we want to call your attention to the toolkit at the bottom of the screen as well. Again, you'll have a lot more options uh, when we return you to map mode. So you'll find a whiteboard button along with uh, the controls for your camera and microphone. The breakout activities will use the whiteboards and some poster presenters may also use that to share their poster today. So uh, we want you to know that you're never stuck where you are in the software unless we're in stage presentation mode as we are now. We've put a link at the top of the general chat in this space in case you need to leave this space during the presentation. You can return to the lobby where everything else is accessible. Um, we do encourage you to move around and meet as many people as possible and have great conversations. 
And then, uh, as I briefly mentioned earlier today, we're going to be opening the poster hall, uh, which, as Heather said, is the first time. Um, after the uh, first plenary and breakouts, we'll be moving to the posters. And around 20 uh, poster presentations will be available today, spread across two floors in the poster hall. Each presenter will be set up at a particular station, and you'll see the presenter's name labeling that station. Um, we have a button that's available where you can see the poster directory. That will show you uh, which presenters are available on which dates and where they'll be in the virtual poster hall, so which floor and which station number. We only have about 45 minutes in that space today, so make sure you visit as many poster stations as you can. Ask lots of questions, and again, definitely be an active participant. Turn your camera and microphone on uh, when you're viewing posters to have good interaction. So poster presenters may be screen sharing their poster live, in which case you can click on it to get a better view. Uh, or they may be sharing their poster in the whiteboard, as I mentioned, at their station. Um, please be sure to look at the map to see whether or not a poster presenter is actually in their assigned room um, before you join. If you, if you see their icon, they should be there to chat with you. If you don't see their icon, maybe consider visiting another station, plan to come back after a few minutes. Um, you can find all posters in the gallery at all times, and you can always uh, go to a station and pull up the whiteboard to see that poster presenter's uh, poster today. So we do want to quickly point out as well that there's a new whiteboard feature that's been added that helps um, with poster viewing, and it can be used for the breakouts as well. When you and others have the whiteboard open at your station, you'll see some colored circles in the upper right corner of the window for each person who's viewing the whiteboard. Uh, so again, they have to have the whiteboard open in order for you to see this. But if you click on a person's icon in the upper right corner, you can then follow them, um, which copies their view exactly as they move through the whiteboard. And this is a great way to view the posters. Uh, and it's a great function for, for the breakouts as well. If you're viewing a poster in the whiteboard, consider um, clicking on the poster presenter's icon and following them to see exactly their view. Uh, you can also click on any person's icon in the whiteboard and click bring to me. And um, that will make their view of the whiteboard copy what you see. Um, and that way you can show them something, for example. So feel free to use those new features in both the poster sessions and the breakout whiteboard activities. Uh, if you have any questions about that, you can certainly stop by the help desk and we'd be happy to coach you through it. Um, I also, very quickly wrapping up here, just wanted to um, quickly talk about the chat feature. The general chat addresses everyone in the room. And the table chat addresses everyone who's currently at the table with you. So you can use that chat throughout the day to search for individuals and send private messages. Just please note that although private chat messages can go across floors and tables, they cannot go across rooms. So if you're in the lobby and you send a message to someone in the breakout room, that person will not see the message until they return to the lobby where you sent that message. Um, so definitely note that about the chat. Uh, throughout the event and all active event spaces, as Heather mentioned, you'll be able to find e-poster board staff if you need any help. Uh, if you connect to any space labeled help desk, we should be there to help you. And if you're having any trouble finding us on the upper floors in particular, um, definitely just try coming down to floor one and check that help desk. Um, you can also double click and join us wherever we are. You'll see a little yellow star on our icons on the map view. And you can message us either via the participants list or the chat when we're on stage. So one last comment here, which is really important. Um, and Heather mentioned this too, but I just want to reiterate, um, refreshing your browser window will kick you out temporarily and bring you back in automatically uh, to exactly where you were. And refreshing the page will resolve the vast majority of technical hiccups with the software. So for example, if your camera and microphone won't activate, if you suddenly can't hear or see the stage presentation, if the software won't allow you to move, just try a quick browser refresh and you'll likely find that it resolves the issue you're having. Um, so I've covered a lot of info here, and just in case you didn't catch all that, I want to remind you that there is a software tutorial video near the top left of each map uh, that can help you get started, and you can play that at any time. You can return to it whenever it's convenient for you. So with that, have fun. Uh, don't hesitate to find us if you have any tech support needs. And again, with that, we're going to bring up the speakers for our next session. So I want to thank everyone for your attention. Okay, <clears throat> welcome everybody to this uh, session on opportunities and challenges in ecological forecasting. So my name is Antonietta Capotondi and I'm a, a physical oceanographer and climate science scientist at the um, uh, NOAA Physical Sciences Laboratory in Boulder, Colorado. 
and I'm one of the organizers of this session. So uh, why ecological forecasting? So ecological forecasting is emerging as a key player in um, planning and decision making across a broad range of marine resources application. And the reason for this interest also uh, rely on the better understanding that we have on key processes, more observation and improved models, and also the recognition that of the sources of predictability that is provided by large scale climate phenomena sources of predictability that also can be geographically uh, dependent and also dependent on time scales. Um, next slide, please. Due, due to this interest, um, a joint OCB-US Cliver workshop is being planned for next year, for next spring, April 12 to 14, 2022 in Woodsall, and we very much hope to have this event in person. The title of the workshop is Daily to Decadal Ecological Forecasting Along North American Coastlines. And the goal of the workshop is to exact the goals of the workshop are to examine the connections between large-scale physical and biogeochemical processes with coastal processes and identify the sources of predictability across time scales and region. Also assess the suitability and needs for observation that robustly characterize this uh, uh, physical processes that provide, pre pro provide predictability and also assess the major gaps in both understanding and modeling observing capability that limit our ability to predict. Next slide, please. So although this workshop is focused along the US coastline, the applications, the methodological approaches, the data requirements are common across many other regions uh, uh, around the world. So a uh, major goal of this session here today is to really hear from this community, from all of you, uh, in order to strategically and effectively organize the workshop next year. And we thank you in advance <clears throat> for your input. So with that in mind, as Eder had already uh, mentioned before, today's plan is to start with uh, a plenary talk by Charlie Stock on emerging opportunity in ecological forecasting. And then um, have two breakout sessions that are organized around physical regions and forecasting application to discuss and share ideas on relevant time scales, methodological approaches, challenges and opportunity across physical regions and different applications. Also, I think with this session, we would like to bring your attention on this topic of ecological forecasting and hopefully motivate you to participate in the workshop next year. If you are interested in participating, please leave us your name and the email address so we can keep you informed of the, the development of the plans for the workshop next year. Next, please. And so now it's my pleasure to introduce our plenary speaker, Charlie Stock. For those of you who don't know Charlie, he's a modeler of physical biological interaction at the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory in Princeton, New Jersey. His work is aimed at producing quantitative prediction and projection of those interactions over a broad range of time scales from seasonal to multidecadal through the development of innovative marine ecosystem models and the use of state-of-the-art air system models. And he's going to talk to us today about emerging opportunities in ecological forecasting. So Charlie, please take it away. Thank you. Thanks very much, Antonetta. Um, I, I appreciate the introduction and um, appreciate the opportunity to, to talk with folks uh, this topic. Um, the one thing I'll add before I dive right in, because I tried to cover a lot of ground here, maybe too much, is that the one person Heather Benway cannot thank at the beginning of her session is Heather Benway. So I think we can all speak together and say thank you, Heather, for all her work uh, on this session, uh, including fielding my late night emails about how all this stuff works. Uh, so um, without further ado, let me dive in and, and talk about the goals uh, for this talk. Uh, I hope to provide some broad context and definitions to help discussion throughout the day. I'll highlight a number of efforts and advances that reflect either existing or emerging ecological forecasting opportunities across time horizons and applications, and hope that these will help incubate discussion of further, uh, further applications. I'm going to argue that we should talk more often, and um, I've been fortunate to, 
to work within a number of communities within our field in harmful algal blooms, in climate, in biogeochemistry, in fisheries. And it's been wonderful to see how these previously distinct cohorts of colleagues have started to intermingle. And I think we really need to double down on this trend over the next decade if we're gonna tackle some of these ecological uh, forecasting challenges. I'm gonna lament some stubborn obstacles, but then I'm gonna exhibit boundless optimism that we can overcome these obstacles if we talk more often. And, um, and so this is a workshop that Antoinette mentioned, I think is gonna be a great step in that regard. And then hopefully stir up some good discussion uh, for today's breakout. So uh, let's have a go. What I won't provide is, is a comprehensive review of all ecological forecasting activities. These are a couple of nice recent papers that, that provide comprehensive reviews of aspects of what I'll talk about today. And I think have a number of references that will, will set you on a good path for understanding what is a very broad and, and vibrant field. Um, so let's start with some uh, uh, definitions. And for that, I'd like to go back to a, a seminal paper by Clark and colleagues at the turn of the century called Ecological Forecasting, an Emerging Imperative. And in this paper, they start with the sentence, scientists and policymakers can agree that success in dealing with environmental change rests with the capacity to anticipate. I think anyone who's gone out for a beer or a cup of coffee with a group of scientists knows how bold a statement this is. Uh, that scientists can agree on, on anything, but I, but I do think we can all agree that being able to anticipate change will certainly help to meet these challenges, and that lies at the center of ecological forecasting activities. So the second bullet here is a definition. Ecological forecasting is defined here as the process of predicting the state of ecosystems, ecosystem services, and natural capital with fully specified uncertainties. And I'd like to really underline that last point. In order for ecological forecast to be useful, we can't just provide a prediction. We have to pre present a prediction along with our confidence in it so that it can adequately be uh, incorporated into management and policy considerations. The third bullet here, forecastable ecosystem attributes are ones for which uncertainty can be reduced to the point where a forecast reports a useful amount of information. And I think as scientists, we lose sight of, these in two, sight of this in two ways. Uh, sometimes we don't that just because we can predict it doesn't mean it's useful. In other times, we actually hold ourselves to too high a standard, trying to meet uh, a scientifically motivated goal for the skill of our forecast, when we've actually already reached the point where they'll be useful for many applications. And I'll, I'll talk about a few examples of that during the talk today. And lastly, accurate estimation and communication of information content will determine the success of an ecological forecasting initiative. If it doesn't reach the, um, the desks and the, and the minds of the people that are making these decisions, then, then we will have failed in this effort. And so I'll, I'm gonna highlight some examples where I think um, uh, we've been doing a good job, uh, but it's important that we don't miss this challenge. So I'd like to illustrate some of these concepts with a specific example and take a trip to Cannery Row and talk about Pacific Sardine in California. And while I'm gonna talk about this study, our true tour guide is the, the somewhat anachronistic picture up in the upper right corner, and that's Desiree Tomasi, who, who spearheaded this particular work that I'll talk about, and is presently at NOAA Southwest Fisheries Science Center in the UC Santa Cruz Cooperative Institute, where she continues to work on problems like this. But Pacific sardine is um, a particularly uh, volatile species, like many small forage fish that's prone to large fluctuations, and these have been associated <clears throat> with profound outcomes on regional economies. And so this is one of these cases where the ability to anticipate change and perhaps respond to them before they happen might actually be beneficial. Um, the first challenge with an ecological forecasting effort like this one is asking, is there a relationship with an environmental or ecological property that might allow us to anticipate change? With Pacific Sardine, uh, there's a number of relationships out there. And one of the strongest ones is a relationship between temperature anomalies off of California and the anomalies in recruitment. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the term recruitment, it's the, the graduation, if you will, of a fish into the fishable stock. Uh, so not necessarily something that should be congratulated, but something that should be, uh, is, is socioeconomically relevant. And for those of you not used to looking at recruitment data, one might think, well, ah, this looks pretty noisy. Uh, and recruitment data is notoriously noisy. However, this certainly rises to the level of being useful by that criteria that Clark mentioned. And uh, it actually is being used in our, in our present catch advice. Uh, but in the case of Pacific Sardine, we have this relationship to work off of. It also highlights one of the, the lamentable obstacles that we need to meet. 
Oftentimes the relationships we have are emergent relationships between drivers like temperature and quite complex ecological responses. And these may be good for short time scales, but may break down into longer time scales. So a challenge we're gonna have to meet is making more explicit and direct mechanistic connections. But let's start with this one for now. Challenge number two, can you predict that environmental or ecological factor underlying this relationship? And there's a lot of ways to crack this egg. There's the statistical methods, there's, there's uh, very simple predictors that can be brought to bear, but I'm gonna to focus today on, on uh, global climate, global and regional climate dynamical prediction systems. And the way that these systems uh, generally work is they combine knowledge uh, obtained from the global climate observing system on the upper right corner of this plot with um, uh, a global climate model and uh, they integrate these two together to provide their best possible estimate of the current ocean state. And then the hope is that if you understand what the what, how the ocean is today and you have a reasonably skillful model, you might be able to predict how the ocean evolves over time scales from days to weeks to months or even years or decades. Um, but how do you know whether one of these systems actually is enabling you to predict that relationship? The tool we have for that is, is reforecast experiments. And these are a critically underrelated, but, but um, underrated, but, uh, but absolutely essential part of this process. And it's essentially the process of you know, uh, pretending you were sitting in your office with, in 1980 with, with the prediction system you have today and asking yourself, could have I predicted 1981? Doing that same process from 1981 to 82 and 82 to 83 and 84 to 85 and so on and so forth. So you build up this, this confidence that you have in your prediction system. In the case of a lot of global climate predictions, such as those uh, contributed to the North American Multimodel Ensemble, they've gone through this process for over 30 years of, of tests and requiring thousands of years of simulations. But this effort is absolutely critical for those fully specified uncertainties that Clark uh, stated as a critical need for ecological forecasting. Um, we also need data to verify against for these. And, and uh, for example, sea surface temperature, yes, we have great estimates of what the ocean was in, in any uh, uh, state and time, but things like bottom temperature or, or biogeochemical properties become more difficult. However, if you have something to compare against, the result of all these simulations, uh, at least one way to present it is in this sort of minimalist art checkerboard here on, on the left-hand side. And um, I'll just explain this briefly. What's shown on the x-axis is the initialization month for different seasonal forecasts. So January, February, March, April, May, initialized forecast on January 1st. The y-axis is the lead time going out from the next month out to 12 months. The color of each of the boxes corresponds to the anomaly correlation coefficient. So warm colors indicate that, that there is a skillful prediction and cool colors or, or, or cold colors indicate that it's an unskillful or maybe negative skill. Um, what we found with a lot of these is that even in, in, in shelf regions, they can often provide useful information for things like sea surface temperature. Uh, this, for instance, shows that the, the, the expanse of warm regions in the California current shows that through a combination of um, uh, persistence in the ocean system and, and predictable ENSO responses, that there are many months and time horizons where we do have useful information for this SST predictor. And each of these checkerboards holds many secrets. And, 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 and we really need to dive in and diagnose these to understand the mechanisms responsible for this predictability. In this case, Mike Jaycox has a wonderful paper that kind of diagnoses the skill underlying each of these areas of red and, 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 and white areas on this plot. Um, but for the Pacific sardine case, let's forge ahead with the knowledge that yes, we can actually predict this SST indicator of, um, of sardine recruitment. So the next step, is there a useful amount of information in this, uh, in this uh, material? Uh, this is where Desiree uh, really integrated with the fisheries management uh, experts throughout NOAA and said, how do we bring this information into this process and, and did an extensive management strategy evaluation under three cases. She considered a case where the harvest control rules didn't consider any sort of sea surface temp temperature information. She considered a case where it just considered past information from the last three years. And then she considered a third case that considered a little bit of past information, but also a prediction of the future year. And she measured the outcome by the mean yield of the fishery uh, over, over a number of years and the mean stock biomass using a, an operating model for, for how the fisheries work, which could skillfully recreate uh, the fluctuations in catch observed historically. 
And what she found was with this future information and that relationship uh, between recruitment, you could on average attain higher yields and higher stock biomasses than one could without it. So useful information. Now it might seem like we're violating some kind of conservation law in terms of socioeconomic and conservation goals, but we're not. We're bringing in new information into the decision-making process that is allowing us to optimize those two goals in a better way. Um, so there's an example from a seasonal case. Now let me kind of do a whirlwind tour of some examples from other timescales or some, some capacity from other timescales that, that could be applied in similar ways. And I'll start with, with nowcast and short-term forecasts. Now in the US, there's an extensive ocean forecasting system developed by colleagues in the National Ocean Service together with collaborators in, in academia to develop a robust set of near-term uh, uh, ocean state estimates and forecasting capabilities. And these go out by about two to five days. Most of them now are physics focused, but there are additional reliably de delivered products through the Integrated Ocean Observing System, uh, Regional Integrated Ocean Observing System uh, associations that extend that beyond physical properties. So there's a sort of a treasure trove of material for sh these short time scale applications and similar efforts elsewhere in the world. I've provided a couple of, of uh, websites here for those interested in starting to go down uh, this path and would be happy to put people in touch with anybody who, uh, with people more knowledgeable about this. But one nice example that's come out in the recent literature is the application of these systems to Lake Erie microcystis blooms, the cyanobacteria microcystis, which has toxins, it affects drinking water, it affects recreations, and the, and, and the, and the cities and towns around Lake Erie would really like to understand uh, where these blooms are on any given day so that they can um, implement tangible management steps in order to minimize the risk to, to communities. And so this, uh, this system, which was developed by Mark Rowe and colleagues and others at, at GLURL, um, uh, uses a combination of remote sensing from satellite and short-term transport forecasts using one of these ocean forecast systems in order to provide that information. I'll also point out that these applications developed by the NOS eco ecological forecasting efforts are amongst, I think, the best for, for for uh, presenting that information to the communities that need it. And so if you follow these uh, links here, you'll go to websites where there's, there's a video describing how to interpret the forecast, the different elements of it, so that users who aren't necessarily ocean scientists can ingest that information and apply it meaningfully. So I think we could all learn from, from these examples. Um, there are a lot of examples that could, gener that could uh, derive useful information from these short forecast windows and fisheries, which we probably haven't connected the dots enough on. This is a nice example from Elliot Hazen, colleague, Elliot Hazen and colleagues, where they're looking at the, um, the need to try and avoid bycatch of endangered and protected species uh, within drift gill nets used for a uh, commercial sword fishery on the West Coast. So drift gill nets can be over a mile long. And of course, one of the big challenges is catching the things that you want to catch and not catching the things that you don't. So what Elliot and colleagues have done is developed a series of habitat models based on environmental data and, and uh, calculated the intersection between what you want to catch and what you don't want to catch to try and identify regions where you can maximize what you want and minimize what you don't. And these are uh, generated in heat maps like the one on the right here where the blue regions are, are probably the best regions for the, for the, for the fishery and the red regions are perhaps the ones you want to avoid. And so we need to start connecting the dots on the short time scale with applications like this. Others include ship strikes for whale ship strikes and, and similar, um, similar applications like that. We're stretching out to, to longer time horizons. I think there's immediate opportunity to, to extend some of these short time scale systems out to the sub-seasonal scale. And some recent work led by Andrew Ross uh, uh, explored the, the value of uh, subseasonal predictions out to 45 days for the prediction of hydrographic and biogeochemical conditions in Chesapeake Bay. And what he found was that, that um, for sea surface temperatures, even this kind of first order integration was starting to give us scale out to 10 days. And for salinity, the scale often persisted out to a month. Both of these are important drivers of considerations for aquaculture, for pathogens and other and element, elements of Chesapeake Bay, and I think would be readily expandable to those from those short time scale weather to the sub seasonal scale. There's information there to be had. Moving out longer, we already talked a bit about a seasonal application with the um, with the sardine. All I'll say on this is that um, uh, there's there's predictable SST signals uh, in many places around the world. Each of them, each of these checkerboards 
hold their own secrets in terms of the mechanisms and drivers of this predictability. Uh, but we need to start unraveling those secrets and applying them usefully in an ecological forecasting context. Going out a bit longer, um, I think there's a general sense that decadal prediction is hard, and, and, and that is absolutely true. Uh, however, sometimes I think this is a case where we are applying a, a, a very difficult scientific filter to the skill of our decadal prediction systems when we may actually be obtaining useful prediction skill um, with what we have for fisheries applications. It's a nice, another piece of work led by Desiree Tomasi, where she asked the question, can these predictions give us useful information about what the next 10 years are gonna be like relative to the last 50, which is the time scale that has informed many of our fisheries uh, surveys. And what she found was, was that there are many cases in which one could predict whether the, usefully whether the next 10 years were gonna be relatively warm, moderate or cool relative to the last 50. Um, a lot of this comes from climate change signals. So we were very excited about it, but that of course damped our enthusiasm to know that that, that a lot of the skill we have here is to, because we're pumping a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere. Um, however, it's useful and we should use it for things like rain shifts and, and other important problems in fisheries. Um, I'll, I'll come, to, come down the home stretch here with a number of burgeoning uh, 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 developments on that seasonal to, to decadal time scale, which I'm excited about over the next five to 10 years. First, the regionalization of a lot of this climate information. There's been a number of pioneering efforts over the last five or 10 years. Uh, the, the plot on the, uh, the upper right shows efforts to, in the JSCOPE program led by Samantha Sidlecki and colleagues up at uh, the University of Washington and PMEL uh, to develop uh, spatially uh, refined seasonal forecasts for the West Coast. And not only could they refine the physical skill of these forecasts, but they could also start to predict things like oxygen, chlorophyll, pH at the bottom where they affect these shellfish beds. Key challenge for these, of course, is finding the data required in order to establish the confidence level in these, uh, in these forecasts. There are nascent efforts within a, what we're calling a climate fisheries initiative in NOAA to expand this coastal infrastructure to provide a more robust national scale infrastructure for seasonal to, to decadal predictions uh, for fisheries applications. And there's gonna be a lot of opportunities, I think, for collaboration between uh, government and, and academia on this front. So I'm excited about where that'll lead us. Next, uh, a development which I think is close to the heart of many OCB uh, uh, scientists is a development of global earth system predictions. And this is the idea of taking those physical frameworks that I talked about and layering in the earth system dynamics, the ocean biogeochemistry and other things. So rather than a global climate observing system, we have a global earth system observing system and we have a global earth system models. The, the process from there works the same. Develop your best possible estimate of the current ocean state and use it to predict forward in time but instead of predicting things like sea surface temperature, we can predict things like chlorophyll. And those efforts to predict things like chlorophyll through these, again, extensive retrospective forecast experiments have been very promising. They suggest that like SST, there are many areas of the ocean indicated by the warm colors on these checkerboards and the plot on the, on the, on the upper plot that we can meaningfully predict chlorophyll. And like SST, each of these uh, patterns has their own story underneath them. You know, the equatorial patterns here, as you might expect, are very ENSO related. The extratropical patterns, which show this banded structure, are, are related to re-emergence phenomena between seasons. When we can compare these against subsurface biogeochemical properties, we find that the subsurface prediction skill is often even greater than things like chlorophyll. They're not being uh, uh, dissipated by noisy weather, uh, weather signals as, as quickly. And so, uh, so I think there's a lot of potential in the subsurface biogeochemical patterns, which of course are, is mapped onto by new technologies like BGC Argo, uh, those might, may start to provide us with the observational information in order to do those retrospective forecasts and evaluate them against, uh, if not directly observed, something that's close to observed patterns by integrating BGC Argo with, with models. Um, and lastly, the, these earth system models have allowed us to start making those connections between uh, the physical and environmental drivers in fish, fisheries in more mechanistic ways. And this is just to bring us back to sardine. Here's another sardine example, but from the Agulhas current. And instead of using SST as a predictor, it's using sea surface temperature and chlorophyll. And so uh, these are system predictions that allow us to make those tighter mechanistic links that we might expect will, will be more robust moving forward. So I think my timer just ended and I hope that 
the, the talk that I just provided accomplishes the goals uh, for today and uh, look forward to question and answers and also a really uh, great discussion in today's session. So thank, thank you very much. Thanks, Charlie. That was um, a really great overview of some exciting advances in, in um, ecological forecasting applications and some opportunities. Um, so I, I put a little note in the chat. If you have questions for Charlie, please um, put them in that Q&A uh, tab on your upper right hand side. And um, so we have an opportunity to ask some questions. And while they come in, um, I was curious about, you know, this challenge that we have about subsurface data and biogeochemical data is, is a really tough one to overcome. And do you think there's some opportunity for <coughs> resolution reanalysis products to provide some of those um, uh, data that, that could be used for subsurface processes? Yeah, so, so you know, I mentioned BGC Argo, which is absolutely revolutionary for the deep ocean, right? I, I'm, I'm very super excited about that. But one thing you see when you look at BGC Argo, of course, is that uh, it doesn't come onto the shelf, right? The, the, and of course, when you think about things like fisheries, uh, there are, um, you know, most of our fish are caught in, in shallow waters, you, you know? And um, uh, two thoughts on it. One, just because BGC Argo and those technologies can't come onto the shelf doesn't mean they're not important to that shelf because a lot of the signals that propagate onto the shelf come from the ocean. And so, so that's the first comment on BGC Argo. That said, we need to find the BGC Argo equivalent for the coastal ocean. And I, th I think it's probably, you know, gliders and going out and I, um, it's a great talk. Uh, names are escaping me right now. So I don't want to take credit for this, but the expression was, was mowing the lawn. You know, we got to go out and mow the lawn with our gliders and uh, the, it's not, that, that's not my, my, my phraseology. Uh, so don't attribute this to me, but um, I loved that expression. And uh, uh, I think we need to find a way to, to do that Kind of routine and revolutionary uh, observing of the coastal systems uh, in the same way that we've started to be able to do it with BGC Argo for the global ocean. Great. There's a question from Mike Patterson um, who uh, asks, you know, what do you view as the leading stubborn obstacles, both scientifically and technologically? <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah. So um, I mentioned a couple in, in the uh, in the talk, and I. Uh, so one, one, of course, was was the observations to, you know, if you're going to forecast something, you, you really need to verify it against something because of that, you know, fully specified uncertainty that it's critical to be able to, to, to give not only a best prediction, but a sense for how confident you are in it. And, and uh, those reforecasts, that arduous work is, is critical. If I were to pick the, the biggest one, I might actually pick the first step in this process, which is understanding the relationship between you know the environment and ecosystem and, and and the organismal responses now i say that with a little caution because i don't want to say we don't know enough to do stuff because we do we we understand habitat well enough to to make useful predictions so you know that 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 um uh bar of usefulness we can meet in a lot of cases so i don't want people to say ah you know it's so complicated we can't do anything and that's a cop up we can do stuff you know, but that is a particularly difficult challenge, particularly in a changing ocean, where we need to be humble about how we interpret those and really nail down that uncertainty so we're not overconfident in our predictions. And so, you know, whether it's process studies or, or, or um, studies that, that are blending, you know, physical, climate, biogeochemical ecosystem observations in a way to understand those uh, interconnections. Um, the third one before I forget, of course, is a stakeholder interface, you know, you know, um, and um, <laughs> Jamie's question is sort of reminding me of this because she just popped one in the, in the question and answer. Um, we got to do the hard work to understand what questions are useful to, to answer. And and, um, and that's not easy uh, because I always remember, you know, when was, we're working with Desiree on the on the sardine project, we sat down to try and scope out what, what to do. and we had come up with a list of about 20 things we might be able to predict. And we narrowed it down to two when we started considering, well, if we predict this, is someone going to be interested in using it and, and how? And, and that's what led us to this, this sardine example and, and contacting those, those fisheries uh, scientists and, and managers 
to understand how we could integrate this. And so I think that's that's another challenge is to really robustly engage with those communities to answer useful questions. Great, Susanna um, notes that um, you know mowing the lawn is was one way to do um, uh, consistent sampling. But what are the role of episodic events and adaptive sampling for catching infrequent events that can drive ecosystem function? Yeah, that's a good that's a good point. Um, uh, you know, I, I think I think we can achieve a balance, right? You, you know, I, I uh, thinking back to there's a. Fei Chai has given us a great talk about the BGC Argo experience where uh, I think they had accidentally set one of their floats to be sampling at high frequency. And and next thing you know, this great storm passed over and said, wow, there's some great stuff. Keep it going. Keep it going. I, I, I love that. So having that blend of, of, of providing this robust uh, foundation of observations, but then being able to say, um, you know, okay, you know, th this is really interesting. We need to get the full capacity out here now to observe what's going on, I think is important. And, th and the other element, I think, you know, for those mechanistic connections, we need those process studies that often involve very intense sampling across, you know, the drivers through the responses. So uh, we need a robust portfolio, but I, I have to admit when I, when I looked at the BGC Argo coverage and I just, I see these coasts missing, I was like, we should be able to get to that robust monitoring on the coast if we can come together and come up with a plan. I don't know enough about the observational technologies to, to know whether my optimism is unfounded, but I said I was gonna have boundless optimism. And it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I love this upvoting system. So if you have a question that you're super excited about, um, given that we have limited time, be sure to upvote. And um, Mike Roman is asking, oh, Hongji, no, you, sorry, Mike, you just got outvoted. Um, <laughs> Hongji Wang asks, can you share your thoughts on distinguishing natural variability from anthropogenic um, uh, changes that are causing long-term uh, trends? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so I think uh, it, 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 the last example from Desiree's work on, on the decadal prediction, I think, is, is a nice example of that parsing of these there's there's sort of two mechanisms of, of prediction skill that that on certain time scales can both work to our benefit for ecological forecasting uh, uh, applications and of course it's also good to know uh, where that prediction skill is coming from so that you understand what the consequences of our of the things that we can control have been but you know a lot of the same um, uh, advances uh, map onto the detection attribution problem right large ensembles, uh, uh, tools that are integrating uh, the full scope of signals driving drivers of change, whether it's the carbon dioxide we're pumping in the atmosphere, the, the initial state of the ocean and the evolution of that ocean over time. Uh, and so I, I think if we, you know, if we continue to assert ourselves in creating these ensembles, then we have these established methodologies to try and diagnose those. One of the key challenges with that diagnosis is of course, that the detection attribution is sometimes challenged by the by the skill of of the models and its ability to represent the variability versus the change. So that's going to also call for some fundamental improvement in our in the tools that we use to make that detection attribution. So more on the research side. Uh, Victoria, there, there are also some interesting questions in the chat. I think Amy, did you? I think Amy moved her question over. Let me get to Mike because he's he's. Uh, I I already <laughs> already <laughs> down. <laughs> Uh, he said, in order to collect more environmental data relevant to fisheries, do you think there are opportunities for fishers to use relatively inexpensive sort of temperature and salinity sensors on their nets? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think there's a, a nice example of the Northeast Fisheries Science Center led by Jim Manning and colleagues where they, where they have uh, temperature sensors on lobster traps. I forget the acronym for yeah. that. But, um, but I think that's a great uh, example of industry uh, uh, you know, you know, science industry collaboration to, to better understand the system and make mutually beneficial uh, decisions. So, so yes, uh, the, my, I can put you in touch with the folks at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. The, the names don't come to me like they used to, but um, absolutely. I think there's some information in the chat on that from maybe from uh, Monique and uh, Sam. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, so I think uh, Monique yeah, is telling us about something developed in, in Bari that started to fill the Argo gap and Sam uh, is talking to us about the fishermen are collecting data on the Northeast shelf. So I think- So uh, let's see if we can squeeze Amy Moss in quickly before we run out of time. Uh, she says, if you have a specific question, can you use the models to tell us what physiological relationships you need experimentalists to address? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think that 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 this is one of these we need to talk uh, more kind of moments, right? Where, mm -hmm. where, you know, what I like about that question is 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 it gets to the heart of the way we should be approaching these things, starting with the question we need to answer, right? So, you know, when I being at GFDL, I think about what's driven our model development over over many years, and you know, a, a lot of the the recent effort, you know, the effort over the past several decades has been driven by this question of will the earth warm if we continue to pump CO2 into the atmosphere, right? And so it's question driven. And, and I think that, um, you know, Amy's question really gets at the heart of that, where if we start with, you know, what's really going to help? You know, what, what do we really need to answer in order to sustain our marine resources, to sustain our coastal communities? And we work from that back, you know, backward to the, to the thing, what we can we predict this? Can we, what do we need to do to understand this? Then I think we're in a good place. I think sometimes we fall into the thing of, wow, you know, um, there's some fascinating phenomena out here, and then the the applications of the ecological force forecasting becomes sort of uh, it's serendipitous, right? It's like, wow, we can actually use this for something useful. We need to continue to work to turn that turn that around and say, what do we need, and and then unravel the science. And I think that that can lead to as innovative an application as as, as anything, you know. Um, you know, so anyway, uh, Amy, I hope that hit the mark. <laughs> that is a great segue into the, our discussions, right? And so um, maybe we can thank um, Farley for a, a wonderful talk and continue this discussion um, in the breakout rooms, because I think that's exactly what we're hoping to do is to find somebody who knows, you know, that diatom, you know, are sensitive to a particular feature and, 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 and pair them with a modeler, perhaps. So, um, so the breakout sessions today, um, I hope that no one here will feel intimidated. You do not have to be an expert on any region or any topic. We want to bring new ideas and people together. And, you know, um, it is a great brainstorming opportunity. It's a great chance to meet people and it's a great chance to learn. So um, uh, feel free to choose a topic or a region that you're not an expert in. If, and and uh, and if your favorite topic doesn't have a lot of people at your table, join another table where there's a really active discussion, please. Um, so in the coming months, thank you, Heather, um, we're going to be synthesizing these discussions into a series of blog posts that will be available on the workshop website so that you guys can all learn from each other and from the discussions. and. Um, We'd also like to be convening some panel discussions with managers so that we can address some of these issues about, are we producing something that we think is cool as scientists or are we producing something that is useful, actionable and relevant? Um, and so finally, what we hope is that the discussions today will give us a picture of the how the community is viewing these gaps and how we can strategically plan for our workshop. Next slide. And so the worst case scenario is that six experts on in the Mediterranean Sea and who work on hypoxia are all talking at the same table because they already know everything each other has to say. Click. And the best case scenario, um, you know, is that we actually get interdisciplinary collaboration. So, um, so I'm. Let me bring forward the questions for the first session. These are going to be posted on your whiteboard. And um, we're gonna, um, so you don't have to remember them right now. Recall those are floors one through four and you're gonna wanna fill from floor one up. Um, so you'll be seated at tables of common kind of physical characteristics. And after 30 minutes, we'll move to breakout session two, which is oriented a little bit differently instead around the actual application. So thinking about cross area, cross physical region, um, uh, sharing common commonalities if you are predicting um, hot, you know, ocean heat waves, for example. Um, 
And so after um, we go through the second session, we will um, break up and do a summary and synthesis phase of about five minutes just to um, the reporters will go back to their table um, that they selected as their reporting table and just kind of try to remember what were the top topics. So we hope you are going to be writing on that whiteboard because that's going to serve as the archive of your discussions that will feed into this synthesis and these blog postings. Um, so next slide, please. So the what, what you're going to do at each table first is choose two reporters, and those two reporters will come back and synthesize the discussion. So you can only be a reporter at one table, right? You can't do it on both sessions. Add your contact information, please, to the white heart, whiteboard as either a participant or a reporter so that we can attribute you. Click. Okay, so this is, you should have a space on the whiteboard that's already ready for that. And then, you know, get creative. So, you know, draw a diagram and put up a plot from one of your recent papers and share that information with your table. Um, I forget what the next thing I have coming up in the slide is, Heather. <laughs> Make little notes with arrows. And then again, at the end of your session, um, the reporters will come back and maybe just jot down a quick summary and synthesis so that we, and, and we'll have your name so we can come back to you and, and interpret what you said as we think about synthesizing across tables for these blog postings. So that is, that is the plan. I hope this is fun. I hope you meet um, new people. And if you're having a fantastic discussion, please continue it. So don't feel that you have to answer every question on that whiteboard. They're just meant to get things um, flowing. So I think we are ready to go ahead and break out into our groups.